Uh, but could I bring up Thomas Quinn, please? Uh, Thomas is a professor at the School of Aquatics and Fisheries at the UW, if I got that right. Anyway, I'm sure it's all. Fisheries and Aquatics, something to that effect. Um, so uh, to talk about a, a little known fish to us in Puget Sound, in the Salish Sea, uh, but not to the orcas because uh, I'm sure it's a uh, delectable dinner item for them. Anyway, uh, please greet Thomas Quinn. seals, marvelous looking animals. They look like something out of Dr. Seuss. What's up with that? Anyway, so you might wonder how a fish guy ended up in this meeting. Um, I actually was invited. In fact, in actual fact, I was invited three times. Once I was invited and had a professional conflict, and then last year I had a personal conflict. But Cindy persisted, and here I am. Um, before I get going, just, just a thought here, you know, you don't have to spend very much time going through the parking lot looking at the license plates to see what kind of an audience we've got here. Uh, pretty, pretty clear, but of course, whenever we have, as ecologists, thinking about predator-prey interactions, there's the predator and there's the prey. And just as there's no dark without night, there's no yin without yang, there's no predator without prey. So I hope you'll follow along here and talk about so-called resident salmon in the Salish Sea. Small cuts and a knotty problem. If you're expecting a conclusion here, uh, you might as well leave now, but you will, I hope, get some information about the use of Puget Sound, Salish Sea, by different species of salmon, with a focus on Coho and Chinook. And since there's lots of extra time, I'll be happy to hang around and be sort of a general answer man for your all assorted salmon questions. So what I'd like to do is talk about migration and residency as general ecological principles. And of course, you talk about resident killer whales, and many of us are familiar with migration as a general animal phenomenon. Then I'll talk about some of the patterns of salmon and trout, how they use marine waters in general, and Puget Sound in particular. And then a focus on some of the inland marine waters used by salmon, including those right around here. How I got curious about this, and then a focus on Chinook and Coho salmon with a couple of different methodologies. I thought it was interesting hearing John talk about the advantages and disadvantages of different techniques for studying blue whales, because with salmon as well, each technique has its pros and cons, and the overall information we get comes from a few different sources, and then what I think it all means. So before we get into salmon, think about migration and residency as general phenomena. And of course, this includes animals of all sorts, from butterflies to birds, some do, some don't, including people. And usually we think about the decision to stay where you are or to go as influenced by three main kinds of factors. The first is something about your individual condition, your size, your fat content, your, your physiology, something inside you that's saying, I'm okay where I am, I'm staying, or no, this is not right and I'm going to head out. Then we have things like a genetic predisposition. In some cases, they may be runs or stocks or subspecies or species that are much more strongly disposed to migrate than others, and including down to the level of populations and families, and tremendous information about the genetics of migration in birds, butterflies, fishes, all kinds of animals indicating that regardless of the internal conditions, some animals are more disposed to go or stay and also features the external environment. It's cold, I like it cold, I think I'll stay. It's cold, I don't like it cold, I think I'm gonna go. There's a lot of food, things are good, I think I'll stay. There's a lot of food, I'll eat fat, and then I will go. And the ways in which different animals react to the combination of their internal condition, their genetic makeup, and the environment that they experience will dispose them to do one thing or another. And those of you thinking about marine mammals will immediately think about the sea lions that come here and the sea lions that don't, the killer whales that move and the killer whales that don't, and so forth. But I don't think about them, I think about fish. So 
we think about migration as the essence of salmon and steelhead. That's what they do, that's what they're all about. But in each of their different life stages, in both freshwater and saltwater, migration is not the only option. So every spring, things that we would call in the stream trout, pick it over in an unteleological sort of way and think, well, maybe I'll go to sea this year or maybe I won't. And some will go to sea and the following spring they may scratch their heads and give it a go or not. It is always an option to stay or to go. When we think about the migration to sea as obligate, but it's not. Lots of fishes have the decision not to go or not to go this year or at this moment. And we as scientists are wondering why they do and why they don't. And it affects them in all kinds of ways. <laughs> So, in addition to the decision of, and I don't really mean that they're thinking it through, of course they're not, whether to go to sea or not, the other question is where to go at sea, because at sea is a pretty big place, a really big place. And so we have individuals and populations and species that vary in how they use the marine waters. Just think about the Salish Sea here. You've got many different species that come down more or less at the same time and use the waters in very, very different ways. And of course, that's of interest to me as a fish guy, but to people that are primarily interested in the things that might eat them, that's very relevant to them as well. So the first pattern, sort of depicted here by a sockeye, is shown by sockeye, chum, and pink salmon. And numerically, these are now and always were by far the most numerous salmon. So if you want to say, what do salmon do? This is what salmon do. The great majority enter salt water in the spring of the year and migrate relatively rapidly through the inland waters of Puget Sound, the Strait of Georgia, out along the coast, up past Haida Gwaii, the Queen Charlotte Islands, and out into the Gulf of Alaska, stay in the open ocean for a year or two or three, depending on their species, and then come barreling back. You don't generally find significant numbers of them in the inland water, Puget Sound, Salish Sea, except on their way out and on their way back. Their main foraging ground is out in the open ocean. And yes, there are a few exceptions, but that's a pretty good rule. The second pattern we see is in steelhead, the sea run form of rainbow trout. And they're relatively large. When they enter Puget Sound waters, they migrate very quickly through here. They're really barreling along, very well oriented, and migrate quickly out to the open ocean, and they basically stay there until they come whipping back which is kind of curious because in some cases their mother or their brother or sister might not even go to sea at all. Yeah, curious. So we now know that non-sea run mothers can give rise to offspring that go to sea and vice versa and within individual families because I'm growing faster than you, you go and I go, but if I go, I'm gonna really go. They're not half-hearted about it at all. Very, very distant. In fact, there's some steelhead from the Columbia River that have gone well, at least three quarters of the way over to Japan. So very, very rapid, very distant migrations. The third pattern, and many of these species are entering salt water at exactly the same place and exactly the same time as those steelhead and behave completely differently. This is a sea run bull trout. This is a federally protected species. That's a char related to the, the Dolly Varden and also cutthroat trout in farther north who would have Dolly Varden and Arctic char. They enter the seawaters typically in the spring, stay relatively close to their home stream. So within a few weeks, their steelhead buddies that might have been sharing the stream with them are way out there in the ocean and they're still kind of poking along the shoreline, very shoreline oriented, typically spend only some months in salt water, not even the full winter, and then go back upstream. So despite encountering the same environment, they behave very differently. Then, known to the sport fishermen, Chinook and Coho salmon, there are many populations that while they do go to the open ocean, most of them stay along the coastal waters of California, Oregon, Washington, and BC. Chinook are particularly interesting though, because unlike Coho that generally go to sea at about the same size, Chinook salmon's enter salt water in some cases in their first year of life being about 70 millimeters or about so, typically maybe in the mid to late summer, or they might enter the following spring after a full year in fresh water as larger fish. And depending on how, they, whether they come from one of those runs or another, they may use very different parts of the open ocean. And they've been studied among other things by this 
vessel named after William Ricker, one of the most famous fishery scientists of Canada or on the coast here. So they've been studied in Puget Sound in the waters of the Strait of Georgia quite extensively. So what do we know about these fish? It turns out that in addition to salmon migrating out to the ocean, feeding along the coast and coming back, there are some, like right now, here in Puget Sound. And we fish guys often refer to these as residents, not in the sense of copying the name off your resident killer whales, but we refer to them as residents because they seem to be residing in Puget Sound. So go back to this man, this is David Starr Jordan, by all estimates, the premier fish biologist of his time, eventually president of Stanford University. King salmon and silver salmon of all sizes are taken with the same at almost any season in Puget Sound. This would indicate that these species do not go far from shore. In fact, there were so many Chinook and Co. in Puget Sound that the best scientists of the day didn't believe they even went out to the ocean. There were so many around here. And so the fact that there are salmon here is not exactly late breaking news. Uh, for example, went out with my brother-in-law Lenny there who got lucky and caught one of these fish. They're highly prized, of course they were very highly prized by Native Americans who knew that they were out there and caught them with a variety of techniques, very prized by sport fishermen. The gentleman here is part of a group that fishes with what's called the Tengu Derby. So there are a group of Japanese Americans who were interned during the Second World War and clearly they spent those internment days wanting to fish because as soon as they got out they formed this club and they've been fishing every year in a very restricted set of waters of Elliott Bay with very standard techniques and so they're now 70 years of records of the Tengu Salmon Derby in the winter catching Chinook salmon wandering around in Elliott Bay so it's very well known from a variety of sources of information that even though there's salmon out on the coast and the middle of the ocean, there are also ones kicking around here in Puget Sound. So, what do we know about these fish? Just that there are some, and there are some someplace else. So, we can fish for them as researchers, or we can look at records from fishermen. The fishery scientists have their approach, and one thing that they discovered was that Salmon rearing in Puget Sound seem to be smaller than that off the coast. Huh. So, being, I guess, getting older in life, I, I like old data. These are data collected before I was born in Puget Sound and the Strait of Juan de Fuca for Chinook salmon that were measured by standard methods, Washington Department of Fisheries scientists. Some overlap for sure, but the ones in Puget Sound were smaller. Now, is that because they were growing slower or because they weren't as old, but they're markedly smaller body. Interestingly, additional records on coho salmon that were all the same age also showed that the Puget Sound fish were markedly smaller. So it suggests that something in Puget Sound gives rise to slower growth. You think, well, fish are growing slow. Why don't they go out to the coast like they could? There you have it. Now these things were not only observed here in Puget Sound, but also in Canada paper in the late 1940s, and I quote from it here, both the silver, of course the coho, and Chinook salmon remaining in Puget Sound are much smaller than their brothers feeding off our coast. This may be due to lack of feed, so as scientists were thinking, here's a hypothesis, there's less to eat here, or it is possible there is a definite relationship between the size of the fish and the distance they migrate from their home stream. So are they growing slower here? or are the fish that are small deciding to stay? What's exactly going on here? So, in the 1960s, catches of salmon in Puget Sound were starting to decline. In those days, people could fish for and retain coho and Chinook salmon at any month of the year. It was kind of open and there weren't size limits. You could keep a large or a small one. And people were concerned that these catches were starting to drop. So, a fellow named Ray Buckley put this data together for his master's thesis at the University of Washington. And he pointed out that the coho salmon catches in the state of Washington weren't going down. They were actually fairly steady. But it was the Puget Sound component that seemed to be dropping, particularly in the winter. As though somehow there were fewer fish in the winter, these so-called resident fish, that for some reason or another opted not to go out. He sort of scratched his head there. And the state of 
Washington Department of Fisheries didn't just scratch their head. They said, well, let's do something about that because people are going out there and they're not catching fish, they're not having fun, they're not buying licenses. So the state embarked <coughs> on an artificial propagation <coughs> program. Not only were they producing large numbers of Chinook and Coho salmon in hatcheries because they've been doing that before, but they had the idea, based on some very preliminary evidence, that if they released the smolts at a larger size, and think back to those possible factors that affect migration, if the fish are big, they're more likely to stick around. It's kind of curious because we know if they do stick around, they will be smaller. But if they enter saltwater large, they say, I'm feeling okay about myself, I'm not gonna go, or whatever goes through their minds. They also had the idea that if they held the fish for a longer period of time, release them later than they normally would be migrating, this would also retard their tendency to migrate. And this was clearly a self-serving plan because the thought was, heck, if we spend money from our coffers to raise a lot of Cohen Chinook salmon that are caught by those Canadians over the border, what's the point of that? We'd like our fish to stick around so our fishermen can't catch them. And it was, again, self-serving and, and, and perfectly natural. Whether those assumptions were true was kind of where we're going in this whole talk. So how did I get interested in this? And I hope she's not embarrassed. Um, but arises both personally and professionally for my wife who was sitting over here. She works for the State Department of Fish and Wildlife and she and a fellow researcher named Jim West have been investigating the concentrations of chemical contaminants in salmon as part of an overall program on contaminants and health of various kinds of fishes, rock fish, English sole, and so forth. And they were starting to see not only relatively high, but extremely variable concentrations of certain chemical contaminants, PCBs. And they cottoned to the fact that some of these fish had been feeding off the coast and had fairly low concentrations of contaminants, but some of the fish had been feeding in Puget Sound and accumulated higher concentrations, and those were the fish that the fishermen would have called the residents. And so talking to her over dinner and a glass of wine about this, I became sensitized to the fact that there were substantial fractions of the fish that occupied this behavior pattern. And formerly people had never tried to measure like how many salmon go out and how many salmon stick around. The second thing was she made the big mistake of buying me a fly rod and had sent me out on a course of chasing fish all over the place, meeting with fishermen, talking with anglers groups, and starting to learn more and more about the occupancy patterns of different forms of salmon and trout. You know, most of us scientists sit at the desk and sit at the computer. The avid fishermen are out there all the time. And once I started talking to and listening to the fishermen, I started picking up on the fact that these resident fish were a substantial fraction of what's going on, just as Sandy did with her co-workers at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So as a university faculty member, in addition to just a goof off, We've been studying the movement patterns of different species of salmon and trout in Puget Sound, and this includes sea run cutthroat, bull trout, coho and chinook salmon with a wide variety of techniques. Happy to talk to you later about some of the other things that we're going to do, but this has been part of our mission. So with respect to the talk here, a couple of questions. What fraction of the Puget Sound chinook and coho salmon smolts remain as residents, that is, tend to hang around in Puget Sound? Are they mostly hatchery fish, which would have been the thought, we're changing our hatchery practices and so those should be overrepresented. Does the date and the size when the fish were released from the hatchery make a difference? That was the whole idea. Lots and lots of effort designed to keep these fish around so we can go catch them. And does it depend on the geographic area where in Puget Sound they enter saltwater? And then the second question was kind of, well, if they're going to be residing in Puget Sound, do they move around a lot? Do they go all over the place? What are their individual movement patterns? And overall, we're trying to decide, are the fish that migrate or reside completely different forms or part of a continuum? Those studying killer whales will tell you that the resident and transient killer whales are very different. They don't go from one to the other. They're really different lineages, virtually different species, very, very distinct. So do we have the same thing in salmon or is there much more fuzzy interface. So two techniques, and this is a technique actually invented in the Puget Sound area for salmon in the late 1960s. These are what are called coated wire tags. The fishermen here will be very familiar with this. And, and I know this sounds cruel if you're not a fisherman. Small fish are anesthetized and a one millimeter piece of wire 
is rammed kind of like a rebar into your skull. Yeah, it doesn't kill them. They grow up with that encapsulated in their skull. It is coded, though initially it was a series of scratches, now it's actually a, a digital code, indicating the, so the release group, the hatchery, the year that it was released, and a lot of other information. And so the advantage of this technique is you, is you tag lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of salmon, so you get the area where it was released, where it was caught by the fishermen, and the date. And that's what a little coho salmon looks like with a coat of tag. And the things are only a millimeter long, so they're, they're pretty small. However, like all techniques, it has some disadvantages. The disadvantage is that you only know the average size of the fish that were released. You don't measure and keep track of each individual fish. It's not tagged as an individual. It's tagged with a code for its whole group. And you obviously have variation in survival from year to year. If the fish die, you don't get the records back. You get no information. So most fish yield no information whatsoever. And in addition, at best, you know where and when it was released and where and when it was caught. You don't know what happened in between. And obviously, drawing a line between two points that might be a spaghetti plate is pretty dubious. The alternative approach, and I'm going to provide you with both of these, is sonic tracking. Of course, this is no magic to people in this audience you know how these things work. And obviously, you can't use a tag as big as you can put on a whale because these fish are rather small. You catch fish, have it, either put it down the stomach or surgically insert it into their body cavity, sew them back up. The advantage there is you get individual information. You know exactly how large that fish was, precisely what place. You might detect it at multiple points. You've got a lot of information. But the disadvantage is that you don't have a very large sample size. The individuals that you tag might or might not be representative. You can't follow them everywhere, every place. Uh, permitting, major headache, I assure you, and lots of other things. So these two techniques have basically complementary and opposite pros and cons, and together we're hoping to learn something about what these fish are up to. So first we worked on Chinook salmon with these so-called coat de wire tags. We were interested in whether the size of the fish that were released would affect them. The general thought was bigger fish would be more likely to be resident. That's what we would call a testable hypothesis. Though there was a release region, the idea is that farther south and deep south Puget Sound, down near Olympia, they might be more likely to stick around than if we were released from a hatchery up around Nooksack or someplace like that. The general thought was that the date when they were released would be important. Earlier fish would be more likely to go out to the ocean. Fish released later would be more likely to stick around, at least that's what everybody thought. And their age, fish that were released at an older age would be more likely to stick around. Now why that should be, who knows, but that was what everybody assumed. So we accumulated data from the 70s to the 90s. You think, well, Tom, why didn't you just run it all the way up to the present? The problem is in the more recent decades, the nature of the management of salmon in Puget Sound has been that for certain periods of the year and in certain areas, they are closed to retention. And so you didn't have continuous records. In those early years, it was open. you could keep salmon at any month of the year of any size in any of those areas. So the record keeping is better for those early years but alas, they don't run up to the present time, and don't think I'm not aware of that. But you had over 19 million fish were tagged, so a pretty big sample size, lots and lots of groups, 26 hatcheries, very, very extensive coverage. So some of these fish are caught in the fall as they're coming back to spawn. We don't know where those fish would have spent their time. But some are caught in the winter, like now, and we would say by definition they're resident, and some are caught by fishermen off the coast, and that means by definition they migrated out to the coast. So we have some fish that we know are resident, some we know migrated, and some we shrug our shoulders because we don't know. Because in the fall, everybody's coming back regardless of where they spent their time. And I might point out that these are similar data but analyzed completely differently than the way that Sandy did, and the conclusion that she drew is very, very consistent with, so it's fairly robust. About a half of the fish were caught in the late summer, and they might have been coming back from the coast, or they might have been here in Puget Sound, but a very large fraction of the fish were caught here in the winter. And a lot of fish biologists were really surprised they didn't believe us. It suggests that the very substantial fraction of the Chinook salmon do in fact spend their lives in salt water here in Puget Sound in the Salish Sea, rather than going out to the coast, which is more or less what most of the fish biologists, including myself, 
So what controls that? I won't go through all the details and the statistics, but the area where they entered Puget Sound turned out to be quite important. In general, from south and central Puget Sound and Hood Canal, the fish were more inclined to stick around and those from northern Puget Sound and the San Juans were more likely to migrate out to the coast. Fish that were larger had a slight tendency to stick around, but really quite weak. There was a lot of variation in the proportion of residents among years, which obviously suggests some environmental factor. But the date of release had essentially no effect, and so the main hypotheses that we've been assuming, that is, the date and the size turned out to be very, very weak. It made very, very little difference, and that was kind of a surprise. So we continued and did similar work with coho salmon, and it was a different graduate student working with me, in this case, Jessica Rohde. And so we had same kinds of data with some of the same kinds of metrics for coho. And in this case, again, we had 268 release groups, lots and lots of them. There isn't a coho release program out in the San Juan Islands, but they could be recovered there. So we have South Puget Sound, Hood Canal, Central, and Whidbey Basin. Lots and lots of fish tagged over lots and lots of years and lots and lots of release groups, and both wild and, co and hatchery coho salmon. And again, saving you all the gory details, the pattern is really quite different from that with Chinook salmon. In this case, the substantial majority were caught off the coast. Some were what we call ambiguous, caught in the fall, where they could have been coming back from the coast around here, and only a few percent were residents. So the coho salmon that stay in Puget Sound seem to be a much, much smaller fraction of all the coho salmon than the Chinook salmon. Now, why is that? I could not tell you. I'd love to know, but it's quite a consistent fact and quite intriguing. So we do catch them. In fact, you can be standing on a beach now and cast a fly or a spinner and catch a coho salmon. So there's some that are here now rather than out on the coast, but it seems like a much smaller fraction compared to Chinook salmon. When we looked at the factors affecting it, as with the Chinook salmon, the year made a big difference. A lot of variation from year to year in how many stuck around or went out to the coast. The area also made a big difference, particularly fish released in South Puget Sound tended not to get out to the ocean, even though they can obviously swim there. It would only take them a couple of weeks to get there, so it's not as though it's too far for them to go. You know, in this periods of time, the fish could go all the way up to Alaska and back, so it's not like it's too far to get there. Didn't matter whether they were wild or hatchery. Now, if you talk to a lot of fishermen, they'll say, oh yeah, the residents were all hatchery fish. Well, it's because they're all hatchery fish. That's most of what's out there, but the hatchery fish are no more likely to remain resident than the wild fish. It's just that they're more hatchery fish than wild fish, so that's most of what you see. So the propagation practices that people are going to an awful lot of trouble to do didn't seem to be affecting what the fish did hardly at all. So then we said, well, gee, if we know in one year what fraction of the coho stuck around, and we know what fraction of the Chinook did, were years that produced a lot of resident coho, the same that produced a lot of resident Chinook. And with a little bit of slop in the data, in general was so. Years, and we don't know what precisely was going on in that year that seemed to dispose the Chinook salmon to stick around, also seemed to dispose the coho. And that suggests some environmental process. And then we thought, well, we don't have a lot of climate information, because again, most of this information is back some decades. But there's an area, Race Rocks in British Columbia, near Victoria, where they have long-term records of water temperature going back, it's basically it's a lighthouse, lighthouse keeper's records. And we decided to look at that. And in general, in years when the water was warmer, the proportion of residents was lower. Now, again, we don't know the causal relationship. It's not like the water is so hot they're cooking they, or they're dying or it's driving them out. I mean, the absolute changes in temperature are fairly modest, but there's a fairly substantial biological response. Again, we don't know the mechanism, but there's something going on there. On the drive up here, my wife asked me whether I think there are more or fewer residents now than in the past, and to the extent that the water is warmer, you might expect that this tendency to produce resident fish might be going down, because in general, when the water is warmer, the fraction is smaller. So the next question is, where are the fish distributed within basins? And so if the fish are released from Hood Canal, do they just stay in Hood Canal? Do they wander all over the place? And one question is, is there one place where all the residents want to go? I mean, it's like Central Puget Sound is the perfect place that everybody goes in there, or there's certain places that everybody avoids, 
or that everyone stay where they started? What are the patterns? And well, all these hatcheries, of course, we have hatcheries in all the different parts of Puget Sound, so we know not only did they stay in Puget Sound, but where in Puget Sound were they caught? And the conclusion is kind of interesting. There's no sweet spot, so there's no one place that all the coho salmon like and they all converge on it. It seems as though most of them stay in the general release area. So if they were released from a hatchery in Hood Canal, of course, many of them might go way out in the ocean, but if they don't go out in the ocean, they tend to stay there in Hood Canal. And if they were released in a hatchery in Central Puget Sound, even though a lot of their buddies, their brothers and sisters even, might have gone out to the ocean, if they stay in Puget Sound, they tend to stay in Central Puget Sound. In fact, it's amazing how few are picked up in different parts of Puget Sound months and months and months after they were released they have plenty of time. Heck, they could swim around Vancouver Island three times and back, and yet they hardly do more than going across from Seattle to Bainbridge. It's quite, quite curious. So, starting to think about this, we think, okay, the release region, as the part of Puget Sound where they enter salt water is important, and the year is really important. So that suggests environmental controls. Thinking about that diagram of genetic and internal and environmental. The correlation between species also suggests that there's something about the environment that from year to year varies and for reasons we don't understand disposes them to stick around. And the internal factors like the size of the fish comparatively unimportant, not completely unimportant but comparatively unimportant. We'd like to have information on the genetic control, but many of the hatcheries here have propagated fish that have been transplanted from river to river, so we don't have pure stocks that we could do the perfect experiment, so our imitation on that is limited. But again, the problem with the coat of wire tagging is the fish are tagged as batches, we have very limited information about each of individual fish, and we accumulate it over very, very, very large numbers of fairly simplistic data. So we think, <coughs> let's go fishing. So we chartered some commercial purseiners in this we, I'll give you the acknowledgements later, but it's chiefly myself and NOAA fisheries scientists from the group in Seattle, chartering commercial purseiners to go out and catch us fish in the winter when kind of by definition they're residents, so literally like around here now at this time of year, that we can tag with sonic transmitters and figure out where they go. In addition to the commercial purseining, we also contracted the services of some charter boat fishermen who are very, very astute at catching these fish, and obviously you pay the fishermen less than the whole purseiner, because the whole purseiner is a big boat, but if the purseiner really finds the fish, they can scoop up dozens and dozens at once, rather than kind of onesies and twosies with the sport fishermen. Uh, it's hard work, but someone's got to do it. Uh, the basic procedure, a little different from handling whales, of course, the fish are anesthetized. This is Anna Cagley, a woman who works for the NOAA Fisheries, expert surgeon, and we cut a little sliver in the belly, insert the transmitter, which is roughly the size of a cigarette butt, approximately, although obviously it's not a cigarette butt, in there, and it is sutured up. The fish is allowed to recover from the anesthesia, make sure that it's doing okay, and is released on site from the boat because we've had fresh water pumping through. And then the question is, once you release the fish, how are you gonna know where it went? In the old days when I started doing sonic tracking, we would actually hang a hydrophone in the water and follow the fish moment by moment. Kind of fun, but incredibly tedious, and after a couple of days you're fatigued, the boat is out of gas, you gotta abandon it. Luckily, people invented some gadgets that look like this. I mean, it looks approximately like a pipe bomb, although fortunately it is not. About this big, it is a self-contained hydrophone receiver and data logger. So these are submerged in the water, for example, off pilings, piers, navigational aids from anchors underwater. They are essentially listening stations. And if a fish swims by, the transmitter's identity number, and if that transmitter is also telling us how deep the fish is swimming, is transmitted, detected by this receiver, kept as a data logger with the date and the time and the fish's identity and the depth, and it just sits out there listening. And of course, if you just have one of them and you got thousands of kilometers of Puget Sound, it's hopeless. But during the various years of the study, every one of those dots represents a location where we, and this we includes 
tribal biologists, state biologists, NOAA fisheries biologists, UW, various groups had receivers and listening stations. And because we would be sharing information, one guy tagged rockfish, and I would tell him if we detected any of his rockfish, and his rockfish receivers might detect our salmon, and we would share the information, so we got a lot of information. There's still plenty of places where a fish could go that we wouldn't detect it, but we had a reasonable chance of detecting fish in a lot of these different areas. Now, that makes it seem kind of easy. It is actually not that easy. This is kind of what it looks like an encrusted receiver and float. They have to be deployed in some cases by divers that you have to pay, you have liability, you have shoreline permits. Uh, sometimes they get snagged by legal or illegal fishermen, hauled up, thrown away, destroyed. They're suspicious of angler, you know, of, of the government. It's not without its problems, okay, like most of science. But it gives you marvelous information because these receivers don't go to sleep. They're just out there listening and listening and listening for a year, and you swap them out another year later, and you can continue to get information. So we've done a lot of this, and again, the we, there's Anna Cagley and Josh Chamberlain, who, like Anna, works for NOAA Fisheries, and were collaborators on this project, tagged a lot of coho and Chinook salmon, just curious as to how they use their time and how they moved. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. The thing about sonic tracking is kind of science by anecdotes, like I knew a fish once. There's a little bit of that, of course, with the whales, too. You know, I knew a really cool whale once, um, but just for example, so we tagged coal, and about 80% of those that we tagged in Puget Sound in the winter, like more or less now, December, January, where they would have been about this big, almost all of them stayed, but some of them left, and they were detected at a string of receivers going across Juan de Fuca Strait from the United States to Vancouver Island in Canada. And some of those that went out came back, so they kind of got out about that far, swung around and came back. Some of them eventually were caught off the coast. And so if they're caught off the coast, somebody would have said, well, that's not a resident fish, that's a migrant fish, he's off the coast. But he was a resident for a while and then left. And some of those eventually came back. The other interesting thing was that of the ones that stayed in Puget Sound, they moved amazingly little. We had, Hood Canal was bristling with receivers. A fish could hardly burp there without being detected. All these fish, none of them went past the Hood Canal Bridge. And it's not as though they couldn't swim past, it's plenty wide enough. Heck, a Trident submarine can get in and out. I can't have coho, but they didn't. Not because not Hood Canal is no good for coho, because the Hood Canal coho stay in there. If they decide to stick around, they stick around. The vast majority of those in central Puget Sound stayed there. Very, very rarely were they detected down in south Puget Sound, even though there are coho in south Puget Sound that seem to like it just fine. So if they decide to stay, they seem to stick around. We did similar things with Chinook salmon. Again, we caught them with pursanes and hook and line. We measured them, weighed them, and tagged them. Most of them stayed in the central bay basin. Again, even though they, had, they were at liberty long enough to go way up to Alaska and back, it wasn't like they didn't have time to get out. They had plenty and plenty and plenty of time. Some of them left, and apologies to you folks, we called them transients. So they started out in Puget Sound, and then they left, so we called them transients. So just, just example again, science by anecdote. Here's a fish. I know a fish once. Um, so the north end of Bainbridge Island near Port Madison, fish was caught, that's about 10 inches, or rough, roughly a 10 inch fish in November, 1st of November, okay? And then by November 16th, so barely two weeks later, detected at Juan de Fuca Strait, heading on out to sea. Shortly thereafter, detected in, in December and January way down off Willowa Bay. So they can clearly move pretty fast if they feel like it. Fine there. And then back again. So it was initially tagged in Puget Sound. We would have said it was a resident. Then it went out to the coast. And they said, yeah, like where it was. And it comes whipping back in. What went through the mind of that fish, whether it got scared, one of your nasty whales tried to eat it, I don't know. <laughs> 
But we do see these things, and so the, the, there are general patterns, but we do see exceptions, and there's a tendency to think of that as aberrant, but we're actually increasingly seeing a lot of individual variation in behavior, and so rather than blow it off, we're actually kind of interested by that. So, some of the main conclusions. Both Chinook and Coho include fish that have spent many months in Puget Sound. We would think of them as residents. For one reason or other, they then later decide to go out to the ocean much later than the rest of their cohort. There's not any particular month of the year that they do that. They might do it in January, they might do it in March, they might do it in April. There's no particular pattern to it. It's not a hatchery or a wild thing. It's not a big fish or a small thing. It vary with date. It is not clear what would motivate a fish to initially stay in Puget Sound, and then about 20% of those to then change their minds and go on out to the coast. However, those that do stick around tend to really limit their movements. We've done some additional data from the San Juan Islands and a large fraction of the fish tag there, stay there for a long period of time. And again, they have plenty of time to go up to Canada and back, down to Tacoma, anywhere they want, but they don't move nearly as far as they could. And this is consistent with some of the new data that Sandy O'Neill and her group are finding that they're real pockets of different patterns of contaminants. So it's not as all, all the residents feed in the same place and move in the same way. There are real distributional patterns that are quite specific, much more so than you might think. However, there's some other aspects of the fish behavior that are really different. I'm not going to get into this. The day-night activity patterns are different between coho and chinook. The depth of travel is quite different between these fish. They're really quite different animals, even though a fisherman might conceivably catch them with the same lure at the same place at the same time. Overall, their ecology is quite different. Chinook salmon are really quite active during the night, whereas coho are very, and they kind of they sort of go to sleep, so the, the extent to which their day-night activities are quite different. So thinking about this as a conclusion, residency is a natural phenomenon. The Native Americans knew this, the early biologists knew it. Somewhere in the mid-20th century, we got this notion that residency was something that we could create in hatcheries, or that we should create in hatcheries, and that seems to be a mistake. A, it's a natural pattern, but B, the things we do in the hatcheries don't affect it very much. It seems to depend in large part by environmental conditions. And now start to think about yourself as a fish. You've just come down a river. You've never been to Puget Sound before. No one you've ever known has been to Puget Sound before. Your mother was long dead before you ever saw the light of day. You got no one to learn from, unlike a lot of migratory animals. You encounter conditions. Well, this is, is this a cold year or a warm year? How the hell would you know? You don't know what the norm is. It's just bingo what you encounter. You see some food, some little sand lance, some little krill, some little larval crabs. Is that a lot or a little? How would you know? And yet somehow those conditions seem to affect the fish in ways that will influence what they do that we don't come close to understanding. The second thing is that rather than being resident and transient as with your killer whales. They're very, very discrete, different lineages. They don't interact. They're, they're really very different animals. In the case of salmon, the tendency to go or not go does not represent this very great separation, this great chasm. It seems like something fairly subtle that might vary from year to year or place to place or fish to fish has them teetering on some balance point. And if it just leans one way, they do one thing. And if it just leans the other, they do the other thing. But once they've gone down that pathway to stick around or go to the coast, then they behave very differently. So this paradox that it's a very subtle balance which inclines you to do one thing or the other, but once you start down that pathway, all things in your life will be quite different. Obviously, different regime of mortality in Puget Sound compared to the coast different regime of fishing in Puget Sound compared to the coast, different exposure to predators, different exposure to contaminants. All of your life is going to be very, very different. Interception by Canadian fisheries versus you know, Washington. Many, many things are different that are teetering on some balance that we don't understand very well. So kind of stepping away from the salmon as a guy interested in migration and animal behavior in general, I think these are pointing to some very fascinating patterns in salmon and maybe Maybe the, the killer whale folks sort of, salmon's a salmon, chinook's a chinook, what do we care? But it matters a heck of a lot because where these fish are determines their access to their predators. I, mean, I tend to think about the salmon as the protagonist and the killer whales as the antagonist, but obviously the, 
the tables can be turned, you can say, well, salmon really is just out there as food for our friends. <laughs> the extent to which they are available to your friends, whether those be California sea lions that come and go, harbor seals that are resident, killer whales that are here or out in the ocean, depends on where the salmon go. In addition to the work of Sandy and her colleagues, the levels of chemical contaminants that they accumulate may have substantial effects. And what they get depends on where they go. And that's very strongly dependent on these patterns of behavior. So even if you're not a salmon person, or even if you only think the value of salmon as is food for your friends, I think these things are important. And if people are saying, what we need to do is we need to propagate more salmon for the whales to eat, well, think about what you're asking us as fish biologists to do. And I'm not being critical, but I'm looking over there, it says go and go and gone. Uh, we need Chinook salmon for whales. Well, yeah, probably do. If I had that magic button, I'd have pushed it long ago. And if the state of Washington had that magic button, they would have pushed it long ago to make the fishermen happy. It's, it's not an easy button to identify, much less to push, to simply make more of them. But if you're interested in not just having salmon, but salmon that are available at different times and places, you need to think about their migration patterns. So thank you for putting up with an unabashed fish guy at a whale meeting. Um, lots of people to acknowledge, and I want to take this very, very seriously, because as I say, if I say we, it was mostly they. Right? Because the university professor tends to be back at the office managing the, you know, the budgets, the grad students and the NOAA collaborators and the state of uh, Washington Fish and Wildlife Collaborator did a lot of the heavy lifting here. Uh, Fred Getz was a graduate student working with me, Jessica Rohde, Kurt Fresh, Anna Cagley, and Josh Chamberlain had a really pivotal role in this whole project as part of the work that they've been doing in the ecology of salmon and Puget Sound. My wife is both my wife and a source of a tremendous number of ideas as well as kind of critical comments on the half-baked things I think about. <laughs> Scott Veers and Beam Reach played a really critical role in the deployment and retrieval of a lot of those receivers. That was essential help for them. The commercial fishermen and the charter boat folks like Kurt Dobzinski and Jay Field who did a lot of the fishing for us. Yes, we paid them, but we still like to thank them anyway. Very, very big and complex project, and they're all very much appreciated. Um, I'm probably fine on time. I don't, can't see the clock from here. I'll stop. I'll take any questions whenever the moderators think you've had enough. You can pull me off the stage. I'm going to be around later and happy to talk fish as, as long as you like. Thanks a lot for your attention. was, can I talk about the Atlantic salmon release? The answer is yes, I can. Should I? That's a little bit harder. Um, as many of you know, probably all of you know, uh, there's aquaculture for both Pacific and Atlantic salmon in Puget Sound and also very substantially so along the British Columbia coast and uh, a release, whether you could call it accidental or careless, that's, that's a different matter. Um, if I were the, first of all, there is no salmon czar if there were a salmon czar, they wouldn't let me be it. Um, I have concerns as a fish biologist with uh, aquaculture of Atlantic salmon, but I also have significant concerns as a fish biologist with aquaculture of Pacific salmon. For one thing, if Atlantic salmon gets out of a pen, you know when you see it. And yes, there are potential diseases and there are various, there are various concerns related to aquaculture per se, food wastes, uh, occupancy of what would otherwise be open public waters and so forth. But from a genetic standpoint, the Atlantic salmon is not going to hybridize with any of our fish, and we'll note when we see it. Coho and Chinook salmon that get out of pens will then likely interbreed with wild fish and not be no, anywhere near as obvious when we see them. So there's a tendency to say that the, it's the <coughs> non-nativeness, the foreignness that makes them a threat, and I think that it's not necessarily so. I have some concerns about uh, net pen aquaculture for other species in a situation where they cannot possibly be fully contained and where the interactions can't be fully controlled. Yes, please. Which implants? 
Oh, the transmitters. Yes, the question was whether the transmitters, well, needless to say, we had permits from everyone and their grandmother, including NOAA, the state, and the University of Washington. Um, they're hard plastic and would almost certainly be hooped through by any substantial predator. And when people have studied those, that tends to be what's happened. If the, if the fish is swallowed whole, it would be digested and passed, or if the fish was ripped open. But yeah, that is possible, absolutely. You know, I mean, all of the things being equal, all of these animals would be better if we left them the heck alone. And that's absolutely true, absolutely true. And every scientist has to make a balance between the kind of information gained and the degree to which is invasive on that animal itself and that part of the ecosystem. You're absolutely right. Think about it all the time, including potential handling effects on those fish. So the fact that we have caught them and handled them, even though we anesthetize them and do it as carefully as we can, has some potential effect on them. Yeah, we, we do. I think it is very slight, but I have not forgotten about it. Thank you, though. Just in the back, please. So what's the prediction for the uh, robustness of the salmon population the future salmon area in the next few years? If I heard correctly, let me, I heard the question, what is the prediction for the robustness of salmon in Puget Sound? Oh uh, boy, if I knew that, I would be the director of the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's a very, very difficult thing to answer. Part of it is that the, the salmon are not all performing equally. You know, you have this expression, the rising tide lifts all boats. Well, it doesn't. The rising tide does not lift all boats. Under common environmental conditions, not all species in Puget Sound go up and down, and not even all populations of the species. So for example, the runs of Chum salmon in the Skagit River are ghastly. They are horrible. They're staggeringly bad, probably affecting the eagles that would like to be scarfing them up. Same species, chum salmon in South Puget Sound, many of the streams are doing wonderfully. The, the, the runs are very robust. So Puget Sound across the board is not a horrible place. Other than some substantial flooding that affected the pink salmon the most recent year, runs of pink salmon have been staggeringly strong and virtually all wild. And they're an amazing success story. You got a species at the southern end of their range, where normally a species is weak, including some very urbanized rivers like the Puyallup, hardly pristine habitat, under conditions of warm, which would otherwise be bad for a species at the southern end of their range, when cohort are doing terribly, the pinks are just doing spectacularly well. P baby pink salmon has to grow, increase its weight about a hundred fold to catch up to a coho salmon. The coho salmon readily eat them, and yet those little pink salmon are roughly the same survival rate in the ocean as the pink as the coho. It seems impossible. It makes no sense. If Puget Sound is so horrible, how are they doing so well? Unfortunately, a number of the species that are highly valued by people and things that we value are doing poorly right now. Steelhead are doing poorly. Chinook salmon are doing poorly. Coho salmon are doing poorly. Lake Washington sockeye marine survival is great. It's in Lake Washington where they're tanking. When they get into Puget Sound, the, coho, the sockeye are, are enjoying very high survival rates. So it's not as though Puget Sound is just a, an environmental disaster across the board. That's what makes it hard for us. There are subtleties in the ecology of these species or the ways in which they use Puget Sound that cause same conditions to make some do well and some do poorly. Yeah, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife and the tribes do the management. I would really defer to their biologists for the forecast because that's not my stock and trade. I'm mostly a teacher. But it will depend on very complicated conditions, most of which are not under our control. We can control some things in freshwater, not the ocean. And the ocean kind of bats last in salmon ecology. Thank you, that's a super question. Yes, please? We have one time for one more? There we go. So you mentioned uh, offspring from the same individual and choose different migration. Yes. But what about residency time in the freshwater and estuary? Can the offspring from the same individual also have different residency in freshwater? The, the, question, the question was the extent to which individuals in the same family, siblings, might differ in the amount of time spent in fresh in, in different parts of freshwater in the estuary. The, the, the fine scale of the data is not quite adequate to answer that question, but I would feel confident the answer would be yes. 
Okay, I'll stick around later. Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, one more. One more. One more. One more. Yeah. He gets his last licks. Yeah. Uh, we hear the term black mountain. All yes. The time. Is there a definition? I have never understood what the black mountain is. Right, the question is, what's a black mouth? So, that is fisherman's jargon, which arises from the fact that the inner part of the mouth, the so-called gum line of a Chinook salmon, is black, whereas a coho is light or almost white. So fisherman's jargon, black mouth, it's not an insult, it referred to that black gum line, but it has become jargon for these resident fish. So at this time of year, if some fisherman, one of your neighbors says, Boy, I got a beautiful blackmouth yesterday. That would be one of these resident Chinook salmon. They don't call coho blackmouth because they have a white mouth. They just said resident, so a resident coho. But the blackmouth is jargon for that. They're fish that are immature, feeding here in Puget Sound rather than out off the coast. All right. Okay, there you have it.